Hi, and thank you for joining us today for our virtual uranium conference. There is no other sector which has better long-term fundamentals than uranium, and this is all being driven by governments and the move toward decarbonization and net zero policies. And governments can only meet these objectives through nuclear energy. The WNA has reported that there are 440 nuclear reactors in operation, with another 60 being built, and 26 of those are coming online in the next three years. Annual demand for uranium is approximately 170 million pounds and supply is only 130 million pounds, resulting in a deficit, and this deficit will only grow as nuclear reactors come online. These demand drivers are creating a surge in uranium demand and a corresponding surge in price. Spot uranium is up over 40% on the year, Spot is up over 30%, Kazataprom is up over 40%, Cameco is up over 60%. The WNA released its nuclear fuel report and is suggesting uranium demand will grow from current levels of 170 million pounds to over 300 million pounds by the year 2040. So where will these additional pounds come from and where is the uranium price going? To answer these questions, we have brought together some amazing speakers, beginning with John Chapeglia of Sprout Asset Management, Tim Gabriel of ISO Energy and Phil Williams of Consolidated Uranium, Jordan Trimble of Sky Harbor Resources, and Grant Isaac of Cameco. As a reminder, we will have an open chat on the right-hand side of your screen so you can ask a question or leave a comment. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, Bloor Street Capital, and also follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. I hope you enjoy the conference. Hi, John. Thank you very much for joining us. The last time we got together was late June, and so much has transpired since that time. And I want to begin with your marketing trip. You and your team have been on the road for many weeks now through Europe. And why don't we just start right there. Tell us about the response that you have received in Europe regarding your various products. Yeah, sure. So great to be back. Uh, it sure does feel like a lifetime ago that you and I spoke in, in the summer and you know, I remember that time, um, the, the whole uranium sector felt very flat to us. Uh, a lot of excitement had left and, uh, you know, uh, it was a very different time and, and, and things have obviously perked up enormously over the last few months, which is great. But uh, more recently at the uh, World Nuclear Association conference in London, which seems like a lifetime ago, uh, yeah, it was my first time there. So it was very interesting to see, um, you know, the the premier, you know, industry conference. It was very busy. Um, around that conference, we we booked kind of a three-day uh, non-deal roadshow uh, with one of our partners there, and we met about thirty-five uh, different investment funds. So the interest in uranium in the amongst the the London-based uh, energy transition funds and family offices and hedge funds and and some generalist funds was definitely um, in, in very strong. So that was great to see. We, we found a, a whole bunch of new shareholders there. It's always nice to to meet someone and, and you find out they're a, a shareholder. So it was very good. And, and you know, I carried on to continental Europe and, and spent a, a number of days um, in Italy and Switzerland uh, meeting with more. So I think all told, I, I probably met with about, uh, I, I guess about 55 different funds uh over my road trip so it's been busy and it didn't uh it didn't let up when i got back um interest is 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 clearly very strong right now and we've been doing calls starting in the morning in europe and uh, last night for example i had two calls in australia and it seems to be the new norm so a lot of interest um obviously price action creates uh interest in inbounds um but i also think it's it, it's it's been a real bright spot this year you know if you take a step back and and look at the returns in, in most asset classes. I mean, it's been a brutal year um, after last year being a, a tough year as well. Uh, and uranium has been one of the, the 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 shining lights in terms of a commodity that's that's up uh, materially th this year. Um, most commodities are kind of flat or down sharply. And I think a lot of people are, are kind of interested in what's going on there, you know, uh, whether you're deeply involved in the trade uh, or you're you're new to the trade, people are, are clearly uh, are, are are you know looking around and then trying to understand what's what are the drivers here. 
And I'm curious about the 55 investors you met in Europe, how would you define their knowledge base? Are these people new to nuclear energy and uranium or do they have a bit of an understanding? Yeah, I think uh, generally when we do these events, we find a, a broad spectrum. Um, you find people that um, are energy specialists. Uh, they come out of energy backgrounds. Um, they've come out of uh, mining backgrounds in, in some cases. Uh, we met with a number of energy transition funds, um, and they seem to be very uh, well versed in in the sector. But you know, you you are constantly finding new people too, because uh, the reality is. You know, there was a 10 year stretch where we really didn't need to pay any attention to the sector, even if you were a natural resource fund. I mean, we've we've talked to natural resource funds that have told us uh, that they largely ignored the sector for for, for 10 years. So uh, but we're, what we found in the last few weeks in particular is uh, a growing number of more generalist investors have been reaching out to us to to get a better understanding of, of some of the uranium market fundamentals. I think that's very healthy. You know, I mean, if. If this bull market is going to last as long as we think it will, uh, you obviously need to get some new people in in the door. Uh, people have made a lot of money in the sector, and yes, it's been volatile. But um, you know, our investors, I think, generally have had a pretty good experience. Um, and other investors are looking for new investment ideas. I mean, the the days of just you know buying a few tech stocks, um, you know, is is you know that can only work for so long. So people are looking for other investment ideas, and I think that's why there's some interest. And just on the back of that, given that uranium is one of the top performing commodities year to date, I want to discuss the flows into your various products. And why don't we just start with the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust or the Spot product. It was trading at a discount for many months and it's finally gone positive. So why don't you just tell us what you've been seeing in that product in the last few weeks? Yeah, well, uh, as you mentioned, I mean, it was trading at a, a very large discount over the summer, which I think reflected that uh, that lull in sentiment that we just spoke about. Um, but in the last few weeks, it's been perking up. Um, it's it's kind of, it's clawed its way back to uh, its net asset value, which is a very good science, a very good barometer of investor sentiment. Um, and so that's that's really positive because, uh, you know, we don't want to see a, a discount that's too wide or too persistent. So uh, we have been able to get back to capital raising after a very uh, long period on the sidelines. But what's been interesting to us is, um, you know, over over August in particularly, uh, which was a month that historically is very quiet in the uranium market, um, the price just kept going up. And, you know, we weren't raising capital. We weren't buying uranium. Uh, other financial players weren't as well. And we just noticed that the, the buying pressure that was in the market was really driven by end users, which are utilities. And utilities, I think, are really the key part of the story here. They're back to contracting. They're back to buying material in the spot market when it is available. We we see producers from time to time come into the spot market as well and 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 buy pounds. So to us, that was kind of the first thing that caught our attention. Over the last uh, you know week and a half, um, um, the Uranium Trust has been been slowly raising new capital. We were uh, almost out of cash, so the timing couldn't have been better. Uh, so we built up a nice kind of cash reserve, which is important because we have to pay expenses to operate the trust. And as the trust has gotten bigger, um, you know, the, the cash amount that we need to hold um, in dollar terms is bigger. So it might look really big to people saying, you know, that's a big dollar amount. But as a percentage of the overall trust AUM, which is is, is approaching $4.2 billion, it's not. Um, it's, it's very much within norms of what we've held in terms of cash. But you know, we would absolutely love to get back to, to buying some material. Um, the market's been the market's been really buoyant. There's there's obviously been a lot of excitement coming out of WNA. I would say first and foremost, it was the revised uh, forecast that the WNA put out uh, that showed in their model that uh, between now and 2040, the the demand for uranium they believe will go up 15 percent uh, higher than their previous model, which they put out two years ago, and and that's just really a function of uh, more life extensions, restarts in Japan. They included for the very first time uh, the addition of small modular reactors, which everyone has been waiting for. So when you start adding all those up, you know they they translate into more pounds. And obviously, the industry um, is trying to meet that uh, that future demand by restarting existing mines. Uh, clearly, there's a number of companies trying to build new mines, which is very healthy for the industry. 
Uh, and it's going to be a challenge in terms of uh, whether the new production can come online in time to, to meet the expected demand uh, in the next, uh, you know, five to 10 years where we're really starting to see a ramp up. And John, there's many other, given the success of, of the Spot product, there's many other people entering the, the physical uranium market now. Is this hampering your ability to acquire pounds at all? Yeah, there's a number of groups. Uh, I think it's pretty well documented that um, are trying to mimic the success of Spot. Um, we don't really have great visibility in any of them, uh, quite frankly, because they're they're not transparent. Um, they take a very different approach than we do. Um, so it's hard to know what really where, what impact they are having because they're, they're really not uh, transparent in their activities. But I think it's fair to say that other other parties are, are trying to capitalize on this uh, revival in nuclear energy and uh, the growing interest in uranium. So it, it's hard to say. But at the end of the day, uh, our message has been very clear that the, this sector is going to be driven by the end users, which are utilities. They are the biggest consumer. They are buying ever larger amounts of, of uranium through long-term contracts. That's their business. Uh, and that, and the financial players are really the secondary uh, supporting actor here. And obviously, financial players have been more active the last couple of years, but I think that's that's shifting. Um, last year, we saw 125 million pounds purchased by utilities. We think we're already through that number this year, and we're going to hit a new record, uh, which is great. There is lots of chatter about uh, new utility RFPs coming to the market. Uh, this year. So it's going to be an interesting test in terms of, of where we are uh, in terms of pricing and, and um, caps and, and, and floors and all the, you know, the typical contract terms that would come with these long-term uh, agreements. So that's a good overview of what's happening with the spot product. Why don't we move on and discuss your equity products or your ETFs beginning with the product that trades in London? Yeah. So we're, we're very happy uh, to, to share that our partnership with Han ETF, um, where we clone the the uh, Sprout Uranium Mining ETF uh, in a European wrapper, uh, which trades in, in London, Italy, and, and Frankfurt, uh, just crossed through $100 million in AUM. We launched that fund in May of 2022. And obviously, you know, we've had some pockets of air turbulence over that period. So for that fund to break through $100 million is a, is a great, uh, you know, symbolic and, and uh, milestone for that uh, fund, and in the last few weeks, we've we've definitely seen an acceleration of of money coming in, and and you know we've moved from kind of one and two million dollars coming in at a time. On the last week, we're starting to see kind of eight, ten, twelve, thirteen million dollars coming in on any given day. So it's starting to pick up speed. So that's exciting. Uh, we really want to provide products to, to investors around the world, um, and then more more close to home in the United States are. Um, their junior uranium mining ETF is is quickly approaching the $100 million mark. We're around 85 or so. Uh, and that's a fund that we launched just in February. Um, and it's it's nice to see the fund finally start to pick up some, some traction with investors. And it's, it's trading very well. So we're happy with that one as well. And then our flagship uranium mining ETF, URNM, well, which trades on the New York Stock Exchange, um, just crossed the one and a quarter billion dollar mark. So yeah, but you know, it's it's great that these funds are performing, investors are having good returns. But you know, I, I had a quick look today at all the different uranium mining ETFs listed around the world. There's eight of them between the US, Europe, Australia, and Canada. And I asked one of my uh my my colleagues to sum up how much capital have all those ETFs raised this year. You know, when you think about those ETFs on average being, you know, up 35 to 40 percent for the calendar year. Surprisingly, they've raised about $415 million. So despite uh, the sector being very, very hot this year, uh, $450 million, I don't want to bat an eye and belittle it, but in, on the grand schemes of equity flows around the world, it's a drop in the bucket. So, you know, it, as more and more investors get, uh, get to know the uranium story, I think there's a lot more upside with those particular uh, equity products because um, you know they're just starting to, to track capital after a long hiatus. John, as we wrap up, you and your team have been very creative in producing new products focused on the energy transition theme. What new products can we expect from Sprott in the coming months? Yeah, well, I you know we've been pretty active this year in terms of um, adding new funds related to energy transition metals and, and miners to our suite. 
uh, we continue to look for for gaps in the market. Um, I think the reality is the market is very underserved in terms of of uh, funds that are are focused on in, in these areas. I just think it's a function of of very little interest for a very long time um, in all things metals and mining, and that obviously is changing dramatically right now as people start to understand the the enormity of the energy transition and how mineral intense it's going to be and the capital that's flowing into the sector. I mean, one year, it's been one year since the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States has been passed. And if you look at the number of projects that have been announced in the United States uh, alone, it is mind boggling. The number of new uh, EV facilities, battery facilities, you know, uh, mineral processing, solar panel facilities, there is there there are hundreds of billions of dollars of, of new capital investments that have been announced. They obviously need to be built still, but all of that is going to require enormous amounts of critical minerals. So whether it's lithium, copper, cobalt, uranium, um, graphite, I mean, there's just so many different minerals that are going to be part of this mix. And it, investors are, are are very curious about this thematic. Um, as I said, there are a growing number of dedicated energy transition funds that we find all around the world. Uh, I don't think these funds even existed three, four years ago. So it's 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 a new theme. Uh, and I think it's a theme that is going to last for the next 20 plus years. And John, if viewers want to learn more about Sprott and its various products, where can they go? Yeah, uh, Sprott.com is probably your best place to start. We've got tons of great market analysis, commentary, educational content. And that's really your first step is uh, educate yourself, try to understand what you're investing in, uh, understand what, what exactly um, you know you you are holding through some of these funds. And uh, it's a great resource for people. We've got great podcasts there and white papers and whatnot. So uh, I'd encourage you to start your process and and, and uh, utilize all the work we put out, which is a ton of work for us to produce. Well, that's a great overview. And thank you very much for making the time for this update. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great to connect. And, and hopefully uh, before the end of the year, we, we might have another very interesting uh, couple of months ahead of us. Let's hope so. Hi, I hope you're enjoying the conference. Did you know that 80% of our viewers are not subscribers to our channel? So that probably means you, so be sure to hit that subscribe button. Tim and Phil, thank you very much for joining us today. Tim, before we do the deep dive on the details of the merger of ISO Energy and Consolidated Uranium, I'm always curious on how these merger discussions begin. How did this deal evolve? Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. And thanks for having having us on today. It's a pleasure to be here. Look, we've uh, ISO Energy's grown a lot over the last number of years, and we've been very interested to expand beyond uh, the Athabasca Basin and Hurricane. We've looked at several things in the past on a you know, high level, uh, nothing that, that's come together. And, but frankly, it's a very small industry. And so we knew Phil and, and his team, and it really began through some innocuous conversations several months ago where we just started to talk to each other and realized that we've got a lot of complementary assets that really seem to, to fit together. It wasn't, wasn't one of those things I think the market's telling us it's not something that everybody expected. Uh, but when we look at it, there really wasn't a lot of overlap. And so we started having discussions. Uh, we, we dug into a little bit deeper and, and realized on the, on the properties, on some of the projects, and even on the people, uh, we really had a lot of things uh, that complemented each other. And so we decided to start talking in, uh, in, in earnest and more seriously about, about getting together. And Phil, from your perspective, what was the overall rationale for doing this merger? Yeah, look, and and thank you, Jimmy, for having us. Um, for Consolidated, it's really just a natural extension of our strategy. And for those of us that have been, those of you who have been following the company over the last three years, we set up on a path to consolidate projects around the world, particularly in the best jurisdictions uh, in Canada and the US and in Australia. And one of the holes in our portfolio was the Athabasca Basin the most coveted jurisdiction in the world with the best highest grade projects and when you know as tim mentioned we started some conversations and 
And for us, it was an instant yes. We wanted we we watched what they've done at Hurricane. It's a fantastic, exceptional tier one asset, and uh, and we just wanted to be part of it. And and all of the other things that Tim talked about are true as well. When with the team, the overlap with or the complementary nature of the team and all the relationships that we have with the, between the various parties, uh, it was an obvious transaction for us, and, and super excited to get started as a as a combined company. I want to ask each of you, what are the benefits of this transaction to your respective shareholders? Tim, let's start with you. What are the primary benefits to the ISO shareholders? Yeah, look, for us, it's really expanding beyond uh, just the Athabasca Basin. We're we're adding a lot of resources and, and some near-term production in some great jurisdictions. So when we look at how we want to expand, we, we want to expand, we want to look for these opportunities, but we want them to be in the right place. And so... Uh, the assets that Phil and the team have put together in the U.S. and Australia in particular really kind of fit with with where we wanted to head. We want to be a, a diversified company. We want opportunities for near-term production, further exploration, and we want that to be in these top jurisdictions around the world, uh, the U.S., Canada, and Australia, specifically in the uranium space. We also, we also recognize what Consolidated has done in a very short time period of time, bringing together all these projects to build a company. They bring uh, an acumen around the M&A process. And, and so uh, we thought there's also a nice fit there to continue looking at how do we grow out in the future. So just uh, just a, a lot of uh, great benefits, including the obvious one, which is is increased scale, which really will help us uh, you know, move further and, and grow uh, in an even quicker manner. And Phil, how is this transaction benefiting CUR shareholders? Yeah, and a lot of it, it would be similar to what Tim just said. But first off, again, it's getting into the Athabasca Basin with a marquee tier one asset. Also, the exploration portfolio uh, that they have in that ISO has in Athabasca is is uh, is first rate. Um, for us, also, as Tim pointed out, being part of a bigger company, we think is, uh, is important. What we've seen in the market is that the flow of funds starting at the bigger names, being one of those top 10, top 15 Uranium companies in the world, I think, is puts us on a, on a great platform, uh, both for attracting investors, but also attracting utilities to the to to work with us on some of our projects, and again, we'll increase the the trading liquidity and position us for future M and A. Again, just to echo what what Tim said, our strategy will come become part of this the the business going forward, which is let's go continue to build this business. We think uranium is going to be higher for longer, and we and and we see a lot of opportunities to add other assets to this portfolio along the way. So that's a good overview of the transaction and the rationale behind it. I want to examine the most advanced assets of each company to give viewers a better sense of what this combined company will look like. Tim, you and your team acquired the Hurricane deposit in 2018 and it underwent extensive drilling, I believe six separate drilling campaigns. And now it has a mineral resource of 48.6 million pounds at 34.5% average grade. What work have you done on this asset in this past summer and on your other properties? Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. Well, I'll just clarify too. We we didn't acquire uh, Hurricane as an asset. We acquired the Larakis project property, which at that time didn't have anything. So it's just to give kudos to the ISO team. Um, they went into a property that had been um, given, basically sold and and deemed to be, you know, not an attractive one to other parties, and and they found the hurricane deposit. So that was back in 2018, as you mentioned. Several drill programs came up with that resource. So yeah, we 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 have that resource. We think it's you know quite a uh, a full summer resource. There's probably not a lot of expansion there. Although, uh, you know, just mentioning the summer program, we have continued to do some work. We're doing some geophysics around it. Uh, continue to do a little bit of drilling, and I think we'll continue to do that going forward to see if we can be expanded. Uh, uh, around the periphery uh, and even, you know, other pods nearby. But right now we are continuing to move the project forward. We've done some internal concept level studies. Really the next step for us is to figure out how would you mine this project in the most cost effective way? Um, like you said, it's it's almost 50 million pounds, 34 and a half percent. It is along the border with another project called Dodd Lake that's owned by Chemical Arana. We do believe there's something on the other side that the most high grade uh, part of the deposits right on the border. So, you know, there maybe will be a story to be told down the road, but 
right now we're we're taking this forward as a, a standalone project that we can determine its outcome on. Uh, we're looking at a couple of different mining methods from surface that we really yeah, I think have some potential. We're looking at ISR. We're looking at jet boring from surface. We're looking at a number of things to really narrow down uh, the approach we want to take and eventually get it to the point where we want to uh, conduct a preliminary economic assessment. So we hope to be uh, moving forward in that in that respect over this over the months to come. Yeah, and what about your other properties? Are there any of them that you want to highlight or touch on? Yeah, look, we're just finishing up a great summer campaign. We'll have, uh, you know, an announcement on on results from the summer drilling and geophysics. We've done a lot of work um, getting getting these other projects up to up to speed. Once we determine the resource last year for Hurricane, um, we have you know twenty plus other projects in the basin that we haven't done a lot of work on over the last few years. So, lots of geophysics, lots of really innovative stuff uh, to to determine where our our most uh, coveted targets are going forward. We did do some drilling on our Hawk project this summer, which we really like, and and we'll continue to uh, to advance that project uh, in the winter months uh, to come. And we did some initial drilling on our Ranger project this summer as well. So all of that, uh, as well as a lot of other projects in the pipeline that we're starting to really prioritize and figure out how do we want to you know, take forward this very uh, uh, this very sizable, high quality project base. And Phil. One of the compelling features of consolidated uranium is that it has near-term production assets in the state of Utah, and this complements ISO's hurricane asset. But maybe you can just touch on these assets and, and when we can expect for them to go into production. Sure, <clears throat> absolutely. Uh, so these projects you're referring to, we purchased from Energy Fuels a couple of years ago. These are actually past producing mines. They were mined in the the bull, uranium bull market of 06, 07, 08. They're, they're sitting on care of maintenance today. But what it means is there's a tremendous amount of capex that was spent on them in the past. We figure about $100 million was spent building these and mining them in the first place. That's all money that we don't have to spend today. So it's very low capex to move them back into production. They're fully permitted with all our state and federal operating licenses. And they're all are within trucking distance of energy fuels as White Mesa Mill where we have a toll milling agreement. So all that's to say is that we can move them back into production very, very quickly. And you know what that means to answer your question directly is probably within the next six to 12 months, we could be mining these projects. It's going to be a function of uranium prices and when energy fuels turn that turns that mill back on. But our goal as a company and the work that we're doing on those projects today and what we're going to do for the next uh, period of time is to get them production ready Again, so we can turn them back on very, very quickly when the price uh, moves to a level uh, that justifies bringing them up. And Phil, Consolidated Uranium has a number of other assets, but in the interest of time, I want to focus on Coles Hill, which has huge optionality. It's in the state of Virginia. Can you just give us an overview of this asset and how it will benefit the combined company going forward? Yes, yeah, sure. uh, we're really excited about Coles Hill. Point out it has huge optionality. That's on the basis that it has a very large resource, over 160 million pounds of uranium in all categories, ranks as the largest uranium project in the United States by an order of magnitude. The opportunity here, it's a great project, technically very solid. The, the opportunity with this project is that in Virginia today, there's a moratorium on uranium mining. That dates back to the early 80s. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and what we're doing is working very hard with local and state politicians to work on overturning that moratorium. We think there's a lot of good reasons for for that to uh, for that moratorium to be overturned. It's in the United States where domestic production is very low. They're the largest consumer of uranium. They're very reliant on foreign sources of supply, and that has to change. And so this project could be a very important part of bringing domestic production back to the U.S., supplying fuel for their reactor fleet for for years, if not decades, to come. And, and so if we can unlock that, if we can get the moratorium overturned, significant value will be created for the company. It's an asset that has over $100 million spent on it in, in, by previous operators. And so we're pretty excited about the potential there. We're working very hard in the background to, uh, to move that project ahead. And just another point we should make is the fact that the state of Virginia does have nuclear reactors. Absolutely. And, and, and more than that, the, the governor of Virginia, 
has gone all in on nuclear power. His energy policy is very clear that nuclear power is the future for the state, whether it's large or small modular reactors. And, and so that really aligns with our proposition, which is we can be a reliable, domestic, safe source of production for many, many years to come. That's a good overview of your assets. Let's move on now, and I want to discuss your balance sheet. Tim, ISO Energy recently completed a $35 million raise, which was upsized significantly. And I'm just curious, where was the interest coming from? Was it coming from Canada, the US, Europe? Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. I think actually the most important thing uh, to note about the financing is the support we got from what we've been calling the cornerstone investors. So our major shareholder, uh, NextGen, contributed uh, to that capital raise, uh, as did uh, major shareholders of, of Phil's company. So energy fuels, mega uranium. So those those are you know cornerstone investors that and these are some of the companies that know the industry better than than uh, almost anyone else, and and they uh, they are supporting uh, consolidated and ISO going forward. So I I, I take that as a as a very uh, big vote of confidence in the upsizing. We also had uh, Sachem Cove come in uh, for a significant uh, uh, share of that, and and they as as most people know in the industry are are very uh, well respected and very. Uh, influential uh, investor in the sector that's uh, really taken a lot of time over the last number of years to get to know and understand this industry. So really a, a, a great um, a group of, of, of investors that have, have taken up a good part of that of that raise. And Tim, what will be the use of proceeds? Yeah, so we'll continue to uh, do exactly as Phil and I have, have talked about this, a very complementary uh, combination of the company. So We'll continue to do a lot of exploration in northern Saskatchewan and advance uh, the hurricane project. But as well, Phil and his team, the projects that they've been advancing, Tony M in particular, with its uh, potential for near-term production, it'll be important to continue advancing that. And as we've also spoken about Coles Hill, um, putting putting uh, the resources needed to advance that project and, and others within the portfolio uh, of Consolidated. And Phil, the one thing that's become very apparent in the last couple of years is the importance of jurisdiction. All of your assets are located in tier one jurisdictions. Maybe you can just speak to that. Yeah, no, that that's an important consideration and really an important part of the strategy going forward. And again, why we why we're coming together uh, here today is because we we think very similarly on this regard. The better jurisdictions. Are, are going to become increasingly important for investors and utilities alike. We think that the three places you really want to be are Canada, the US and Australia. And those are going to be the places that we focus on. Our ultimate goal is to be a multi-asset producer in each of those jurisdictions. And, uh, and, and you know, really, it really is because the uranium sector, single asset, single jurisdiction companies are inherently risky particularly if you're in some of the more the, the sort of fringe jurisdictions where there's lots of uranium in some of these jurisdictions and there's a history of production and that's great but geopolitical risk is starting to overshadow that and so we just want to high grade our portfolio and I point out that the only other company that's focused on those three jurisdictions is Cameco so we think we're in very good company and just to follow up on that Phil between both companies there's a lot of different projects a lot of different assets and I'm sure there's a lot of assets there that are not not being recognized or properly valued. How do you and Tim plan on bringing out this value in the coming months? Yeah, look, I think we're going to take a page out of the consolidated uranium book. So already in our short history, we've created two spin-out companies. We created Labrador Uranium, which is now Latitude Uranium and has, has tremendous exploration projects in Labrador and in Nunavut. We've recently announced the spin-out <clears throat> of a new U.S.-focused exploration company, Premier American Uranium. That's going to be trading before this transaction closes. And so projects that ultimately don't fit the strategy, which is, are you going to be a near-term producer in one of those key jurisdictions, will ultimately be non-core. But, but as we've done again, as we've done in the past, we'll look to do transactions, whether it's divestitures, spin-outs, or JVs, et cetera, where... Uh, we, we're we're really doing a one plus one equals more than two, and I think we've we've been successful at that. And I think investors should uh, appreciate that we'll we'll, we'll monetize uh, or realize value from some of the non-core assets in a similar fashion. 
Phil, we began this discussion with the rationale for merging these two companies. There's many uranium companies out there for investors to choose from. Maybe you can just summarize for us why investors should look at the combined company or what we call the uh, new ISO energy. Yeah, look, I think it's very simple. We're, we've got a great suite of projects, tremendous uh, resource profile, high grades, large projects. We're focused. We have a very clear strategy, this production strategy, which provides investors with tremendous leverage to the price of uranium, whether it's near term, mid term, or over the long term. Uh, we have this unbelievable exploration portfolio, which we're going to continue to work on. Great team. Again, you know, we talked about the complementary nature of it. We're bringing together both of these teams. Virtually everyone is staying on because you know we need more people to to manage and <clears throat> and move this portfolio ahead. And this capital marks profile, I don't think it can be understated. Being bigger is better in this market. We're going to get more capital, lower cost of capital, more access to capital. Institutional investors, ETFs, utilities alike uh, will will look at this company more favorably. Um, and that's, uh, I mean, I think that really sums it up. And Tim, maybe I'll just throw the last question at, at you. Um, what can we expect in terms of news flow and when is the deal going to close? Yeah, I mean, as far as the, the deal itself, um, we're, we're aiming for an early December close. We've got the financing, which will be closed within the next couple of weeks. Uh, Consolidated needs to do a shareholder vote. I believe that's scheduled in, into November. And yeah, all going well will be, will be done in December. Uh, so obviously, we'll have that news going on. From the ISO Energy side specifically, uh, we we are finishing up and have just you know put the the cap on the uh, summer exploration program. So you will see a um, a release on on those results in uh, in in the very near future as well. So lots lots of exciting stuff to come, and you know uh, you know hopefully you know what Phil and I have done is 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 really you know share that we are excited about this. Like it's, it's really exciting to put this together. You know, our teams are meeting, they're, they're getting along. We're throwing out lots of new ideas and we're, uh, yeah, we're just excited to move this, this forward. Well, congratulations. And I want to thank both of you for spending time with us today and providing an overview of your recent transaction. And we look forward to another update when the deal closes. Yeah. Thanks. Appreciate it. Did you know that every time you hit the subscribe button, your name goes into a draw to win $1 million? I'm just kidding. But if you do subscribe, we will be very thankful. Thanks for your support. Hi, Jordan. Thank you very much for joining us today. Sky Harbor Resources is a uranium exploration company focused on the Athabasca Basin. You have an extensive portfolio of assets. Why don't you take us through the highlights of this portfolio of assets? Yeah, well, firstly, thank you for having me. Excited to be presenting the Sky Harbor story and talking with you, Jimmy. It was good seeing you at the WNA a few weeks ago as well. So Sky Harbor Resources, for those that are unfamiliar with the company is a leading and high grade uranium exploration and prospect generator company. We've got 24 projects uh, scattered throughout the Athabasca Basin of Northern Saskatchewan, representing one of the largest mineral tenure holdings of any company in the region. The Athabasca Basin is the highest grade depository of uranium in the world, consistently ranked as a top mining district by the Fraser Institute globally as well. Built this prospect, uh, this project portfolio up over the last 10 years. So we were there in 2013, 2014, 2015. Obviously, the market was a lot more challenging then, but we were there uh, with our contrarian view. Uh, and uh, we were opportunistic in, in acquiring projects. And we've continued to be aggressive in our acquisitions, uh, including uh, recently acquiring projects from Rio Tinto and Denison and, and additional staking that's built up this project portfolio to uh, well over 1.2 million acres across those 24 projects. Uh, now, these projects do range from earlier stage, more grassroots exploration properties, right through to more advanced stage exploration assets that either host small uranium resources uh, and or have high grade uranium showings and mineralized zones in historical drilling. Our two most advanced stage projects 
our two co-flagship projects, the Russell Lake and Moore Lake projects, we're actively advancing. And then the other 22 or so projects are a part of our prospect generator business, whereby we look to bring in partner companies uh, to farm these uh, projects out uh, and have these partner companies advance these projects while we collect cash and stock on an annual basis from these companies. So it's a unique dual prong strategy that we employ at Sky Harbor, where we're focused on high grade uranium discoveries at our main projects. We're funding the work at those projects while we have partner companies fund the work at our secondary and tertiary projects as a part of our prospect generator business. So we've really built the company up to be a one-stop shop, if you will, for diversified uranium exploration exposure throughout the Athabasca Basin. Jordan, as you mentioned, Sky Harbor has 24 projects, and the two most advanced projects are Russell Lake and Moore Lake. And I want to start with Russell Lake. You and your team have been very busy this past summer drilling out the property. Maybe you can just take us through your drilling program. How many rigs, how many meters? Absolutely. And just to start off, uh, this project, Russell Lake, uh, for some of those that have been following the story will know we acquired this project uh, from Rio Tinto in an option agreement that we signed a year ago. So we're earning in up to 100% at the project. It's a very strategic asset for Sky Harbor as it uh, is adjacent to our existing flagship project, Moore Lake. Uh, and collectively, these two projects uh, represent over 105,000 hectares of uh, property in very much prime real estate in the eastern Athabasca Basin, uh, just south of the MacArthur River Mine, just northeast of the Key Lake Mill, and just west uh, adjacent to Denison's flagship Wheeler River project. Now, there is a road that runs up through Russell Lake that services the MacArthur River Mine, power lines alongside that road. And we are also uh, in, uh, acquiring an exploration camp uh, that's uh, that Rio established uh, uh, on the Russell Lake project, which brings our exploration and drilling costs down. So it was a strategic acquisition for us. Uh, we spent the first little while getting the permits. We signed uh, an exploration agreement with the English River First Nation. And uh, we started drilling this project as our first inaugural drill program uh, since acquiring it from Rio. And, and really since Rio drilled it previously, uh, almost seven, almost eight years ago, actually, it's the first program. Uh, and we started it earlier this year and we're just wrapping it up. Uh, it's a 10,000 meter multi-phased drill program. So we do have assays pending from this program. We're very pleased with what we've seen. In fact, we've already started planning a winter follow-up program that'll likely be four to 5,000 meters of drilling in the winter to follow up on some of the higher priority targets at the project, including what's called the grayling zone, a, a group of conductors uh, that trend from Denison's Wheeler River project onto the Russell Lake project uh, and close in, in proximity to the, the infrastructure uh, at Russell Lake, so easy to get to. Um, and then also another target area we drilled a little bit at uh, this in this program was called the Fox Lake Trail target area on the northern part of the project, which again uh, included extensions in the continuation of uh, uraniferous conductive corridors from Denison's Wheeler River project. There's no lack of targets on this property. There's tens of kilometers of highly prospective uh, EM conductors that have yet to be systematically drill tested. Uh, and we're confident that we can deliver a new discovery at this project going forward. And you mentioned that Rio Tinto is a partner on this project. How do you see this partnership evolving? Yeah, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, it took us a little while to negotiate the terms of the earn-in at the project. But as I mentioned earlier, we we structured it in such a way where it's a staged earn-in uh, over the course of the next several years. We can earn an initial 51% at the project. We're nearing completion of that. In fact, uh, this upcoming drill program should get us over the finish line there, uh, whereby we will have earned the initial 51% at the project. At that point, we can elect uh, to carry on as a 5149 uh, JV partner uh, with uh, Rio Tinto, or we can continue earning in uh, an additional 19% to get us to 70%. And uh, uh, there would be a share issuance and additional exploration expenditures required for us to do that. And then at that point, uh, we, we do have a, a, an option to make a uh, balloon payment at the end of the day to buy out Rio 100% 
Uh, uh, and uh, in order to do that, uh, we would be issuing fairly substantial number of shares. So Rio in that case, even though they would no, they would not be a joint venture partner at the project, would become one of our largest, if not our largest shareholders. So Rio does have a vested interest in the project and needless to say is one of the largest diversified mining companies in the world, a great partner to have. So that's a good overview of Russell Lake. Let's move on and discuss Moore Lake. It's the most advanced project and you are working on a mineral resource. You've done extensive drilling on this property in the past years. Why don't you just take us through that? Uh, sure. So we are working towards uh, releasing a mineral resource estimate uh, likely later this year or early in the new year. Uh, as you mentioned, we've carried out a fair bit of exploration and drilling on this project since we acquired it in 2016, and we, we carried out an initial drill program on it in 2017. Now, there has been a fair bit of historical exploration at the project. In fact, our geological team uh, worked on this project in the late 90s and early 2000s, made the initial high-grade discovery there uh, at what's called the Maverick Zone. And we went back in there uh, in 2017 and 2018 and followed up on that. And and uh, we're successful in intersecting some of the, the highest grade mineralization discovered at the project, including a drill hole that returned 21% U308 over a meter and a half. That was was within 6% uh, U308 over six meters at, at the main Maverick zone. We continue drilling this project through uh, the the last five to six years, and we have continued to delineate high grade zones of mineralization. In fact, just two years ago, uh, we started uh, focusing more on the underlying basement rocks uh, at this project, and we intersected our highest grade basement zone of mineralization, which uh, included a zone of 6.8% U308 over two meters. Uh, this Maverick corridor that's hosted these several high grade lenses, which is what we're working on the resource estimate for, um, is, uh, is, is open at depth and uh, uh, it's really only been systematically drill tested of the four and a half to five kilometer long corridor. Only about three kilometers of that has been systematically drill tested. The other great thing too is the mineralization uh, at the Maverick corridor is relatively shallow. The unconformity is only at about 260 to 270 meters. Uh, so uh, most of that high grade that's hosted at the unconformity or in the sandstone is relatively shallow. Uh, but we believe there's a lot uh, of exploration and discovery uh, upside potential remaining in the underlying basement rocks, which haven't been thoroughly drill tested. And there are other targets on the project, about a dozen or so other regional targets that have had some sporadic drilling, have mineralization in, in previous drilling, uh, but uh, there hasn't been much follow-up work. So we do have plans along with the continued drilling and exploration at Russell Lake in 2024. We do have plans to continue drilling at Moore Lake in, as well. In fact, we can carry out those programs simultaneously as the projects are adjacent so we can move the rig over from one project to the other relatively easily. So that's a great overview of your two advanced assets, Russell Lake and Moore Lake. Another unique feature of Sky Harbor Resources is the project generator business. Can you just provide us an overview of this business and how it works and how it benefits Sky Harbor Resources? Sure. So uh, in addition to the high grade uranium exploration and, and discovery process at our main projects and resource delineation as well, uh, we, we do also employ what's called prospect generation, uh, a strategy that uh, I think most investors in the space are uh, are, are well aware of. And uh, this has uh, been uh, a part of our business that's very much kind of evolved over the last uh, several years in particular. So with 24 projects and uh, us very much just being focused on two or three of those at any given time, uh, instead of letting these other assets sit there and collect dust, we, we've been very active with looking to bring in partner companies uh, that can then earn in uh, through an option agreement and ultimately work towards a joint venture partnership. Uh, but uh, bring in partner companies to advance the secondary and tertiary projects. So of those uh, other 22 projects, we've signed eight separate option agreements with eight other partner uh, companies uh, over nine of those 22 projects. Um, two of those eight option agreements are now joint ventures, one with 
uh, Arano, France's largest uranium mining and nuclear fuel cycle company. Uh, they have a 51% stake in the Preston project. We retain a minority interest in that project. We are expecting some, some additional exploration uh, in the new year at that property. And then the other joint venture we have is with a company called Azincourt Energy at our East Preston project, whereby they've earned majority interest in that project. Now, the other six option partners are still earning in. So uh, they're still having to make cash and share payments annually and fund 100% of the exploration at these projects annually. Uh, and it's been a great compliment to uh, us focusing in at our main projects, Russell and more. And again, having these partners, the partner companies come in and fund the work at these other properties, it provides a lot of additional news flow. And most importantly, um, it provides our shareholders with exposure uh, to several other projects that are being actively advanced uh, by other partner companies. Uh, so you can think about it, uh, think about it as having multiple irons in the fire, uh, and it provides this optionality value that is unique to Sky Harbor. And Falcon Point is another advanced stage exploration project in the portfolio that has now been split up and optioned out to several different option holders. Can you just talk to this or talk about this asset? Yeah, so this is a good example of the, the prospect generator business in action where we acquired this asset back in 2014 at uh, a, you know a very attractive price and valuation. And subsequently, we've now optioned three different parts of the project off uh, to three different partner companies. Uh, the northern part of the project, we optioned to an ASX listed company called Valor Resources. They're nearing completion of that option agreement, uh, having spent uh, money in the field and having made uh, uh, cash and share payments uh, to Sky Harbor uh, over the course of the last several years. That project is now called Hook Lake. Uh, and we are expecting that they'll continue advancing that project, uh, likely as a, as a joint venture partnership um, uh, after 2024. Uh, and then the uh, bottom half of the project, we've, we've uh, split up into two separate projects and optioned each of them off. Uh, our South Falcon East part of the project, which is host to a small, um, sh a shallow uh, res uranium mineral resource um, that is um, uh, not huge. It's not high grade, but as the uranium price continues to move higher, uh, it does get more exciting and, and, and probably even more exciting from an exploration standpoint is the potential to expand on this inferred resource and continue to drill a little bit deeper as it's right at surface and look for higher grade zones. In fact, we carried out some drilling in 2015 at this project and did discover that the tenor, the grade of mineralization does pick up at depth. Now we optioned this pro uh, project off to a company called Tisdale Energy. Uh, we are expecting that they'll be completing some exploration and drilling in the new year, in addition to uh, making the, the, the annual cash and share payments. So we're excited for them to get to work there. And then uh, more recently, uh, just uh, several months ago, we uh, optioned out the final part of this uh, project called the South Falcon project to a company called North Shore Energy. Uh, and uh, again, we are expecting that they will be completing some exploration uh, and uh, potentially drilling it uh, in the new year as well. And when you add up the combined project consideration of all three of these option agreements uh, on that Falcon Point, the original Falcon Point project, it's tens of millions uh, that would be coming in in cash, stock, and in exploration funded by the partner company. So it just goes to show the, you know, the, the value uh, that you can uh, realize on these projects as the market improves and as you find the right partners to come in. Um, and just a, a note on that, um, in getting back to the previous discussion of the entire prospect generator business. So of those eight option agreements that we've, we've signed again, two of them have gone through to completion. Um, assuming that the remaining six uh, are completed, uh, that will represent well over 85 million in combined project consideration. So that's exploration expenditures funded by the partner companies. Uh, that's cash payments coming into Sky Harbor and that's share issuances uh, coming into Sky Harbor as well. Now, that's assuming that all these companies uh, fully complete uh, their earnings. Uh, but even if we if we get a fraction of that amount, it's a significant amount 
of, of, of money, stock, and, and funding coming in uh, that us and our shareholders will benefit from. And because you're talking about the cash element of the project generator model, why don't we just jump right into your balance sheet? Cash is the lifeblood of any exploration company. How much cash do you have on hand and how will you allocate that in the coming year? Sure. So we're well funded with about four and a half million in the treasury. Um, we, as I pointed out earlier, um, receive cash payments and share issuances on a regular fairly regular basis throughout the year from these various partner companies. So we are expecting uh, another million plus dollars in cash and stock to come in before year end. Uh, and uh, over the next 24 months, again, assuming that all the partner companies uh, complete their respective earnings, we could receive upwards of 10 million in cash and stock from these various partner companies. And that's assuming that we sign no more uh, additional option agreements. We are in advanced negotiations on uh, 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 several of the dozen or so other projects that we own 100% of in our project portfolio. I expect we we should be able to announce new partnerships and, and option and JV agreements in the next year or so. Uh, but yeah, that's assuming the status quo. And and uh, so that that would fund the the lion's share of um, the exploration that we're planning, GNA additional acquisition. So it's a it's a good way to uh, mitigate equity dilution uh, as well. Jordan, as we wrap up, what can investors expect in terms of news flow from Sky Harbor Resources in the coming months? We're going to have a very busy six to 12 months ahead of us. Uh, you know, Imminently, we are expecting news flow on the drill results from Russell Lake, this initial 10,000 meter drill program, and following up on that news on a winter program that's already being planned at Russell Lake. We are planning uh, to continue drilling right through the new year at Russell Lake, uh, fully permitted for that and funded uh, for that as well. And as I mentioned, we are also uh, expecting additional drilling at Moore Lake on the back of a mineral resource estimate. So lots going on with the two main projects. As far as the uh, partner companies go, uh, I, we are expecting work programs from our two joint venture partners, Arano and Azincourt. We'll have news out on that in the coming weeks and months. And of the option, the six option partners, I'm expecting uh, at least three, maybe four of them to be carrying out exploration uh, and or drill programs in the coming six to 12 months. Uh, again, they have to fund all of that. Uh, so a lot of news flow, uh, a, lot, a number of irons in the fire. And uh, really what we're trying to do uh, is, is offer uh, as much exposure to multiple potential new discoveries in the Athabasca Basin across several different projects. Well, Jordan, that was a great overview and a great update on Sky Harbor Resources, and I look forward to our next update. Thank you very much for having me, Jimmy. Did you know we're now on Spotify and Apple Podcasts? So now you can listen to us on Spotify or Apple and listen and learn when you're stuck in traffic on the 401 in Toronto, the I-95 in New York, or the I-5 in LA. So be sure to subscribe and follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Grant, thank you very much for joining us today. Cameco is the second largest uranium producer in the world, and so you have great insights on what's happening with the uranium price and also the conversion pricing. And I want to discuss both of these topics. But before we do that, why don't we just start with the press release that you issued in early September, which provided an update on production. And within that press release, you noted that there were challenges at Cigar Lake and also at the ramp up at the Key Lake Mill. Why don't we begin right there and provide us with a little more context as to what's happening and if this is just a one-off. Yeah, you, you will have noticed that while we were talking about production to the end of this year, December 31st, we didn't change our guidance for 2024. We have multi-year production guidance out there. Uh, it's still 18 million pounds for MacArthur Key next year and 18 million for Cigar. So that should be the, the clearest indication that this is we view this as some short-term issues. Uh, we typically don't do off-cycle press releases. Uh, it's not something we normally do. But I think folks who know us really well notice, know that we're transparent and we're accountable. And we weren't about to go into 
uh, WNA week, which is the biggest week in the nuclear industry, see a global customer base, see a bunch of investors, see all our joint venture partners, and then sneak news like that out the back door later uh, and miss the opportunity to be held accountable for that news. So we put out the press release to make sure it was in the market and we could discuss it accordingly during the WNA week. So the main message, short-term issues, we, they won't affect next year's guidance, haven't affected next year's guidance. And, and if there's a takeaway to global fuel buyers, if there's a takeaway to investors, it, it probably is that uh, you know production should never be taken for granted. You know, the only people who tell you it's easy are the people who have never done it. So as the world needs more production to come online, it's part of why we are very confident that prices still need to discover levels that are going to incent meaningful investment in new supply. And we see that if you can't take current supply for granted, then we shouldn't be thinking that new supply is going to come and set records for on time and set records for it's just it's going to be difficult and uh, and uh, we think that that uh, needs to be reflected in the market so let's move the discussion toward the term market i'm not going to ask you about the spot market because you always tell me that that's not the real market with uranium but you also mentioned that you were in london for the world nuclear symposium and why don't you give us some color as to what you're hearing from fuel buyers yeah and and by the way, congratulations to you. You were you were at the at the WNA and you were front and center uh, with uh, with your with your uh, media opportunities. And sorry we didn't get a chance to do that uh, to have this chat during the symposium. Uh, as you know, Cameco, because we're right across the fuel cycle, involved in everything. Uh, we just di didn't end up being able to elbow up the time to do it. So I'm glad we're able to catch up now and reflect on some of the things that we've heard. The, the main takeaways from the WNA this year are, were obviously reflected in a very material increase in the need for supply reflected in the WNA fuel market report. So that demand outlook continues to grow. Tim Gitzel, our CEO, has called it the best ever. Um, we agree with that comment, obviously, not just because he's the boss, but I, I think the evidence is there. And there's a urgency of supply that's setting in. And so we're starting to see more of the utilities reflected in the in the long term contracting to date start to understand that. But, you know, our message hasn't changed back to the market, which is it's good to say there's an urgency of supply setting in, but it ultimately needs to be reflected in more of an urgency of demand. So the market needs to see more demand, more homes need to be built for future production as more demand comes to the market it obviously will strengthen uh, market opportunities and, and overall discover those production economic prices required, not to just bring back existing supply, but actually to invest in new supply going forward. So we still believe we're, we're in the rather early innings uh, of this transition. And so in, I'm sure you're talking to many utilities and I know you can't provide a lot of detail, but maybe you can just give us some color as to what terms they are asking for in, in are they looking for production three years out, five years out, or are they going to 10 years? Yeah, great question. This market has moved away from a market dominated by surplus disposal in the spot market by producers who have productive capacity but never did the hard work of building homes for it. So as they jammed it through the spot market, it had considerable downward pressure on the price. And in a low interest rate environment that persisted several years ago, that gave rise to the carry trade. That carry trade effectively moved the term market away from really focused on long-term requirements to a much shorter tenor where utilities were coming in and they were taking two to four year bites out of the market because they wanted someone to come in, buy surplus in, in, in the spot market, hold it on a very low cost of carry. And that effectively, you know, th those producers who sell into the spot market effectively collapse the term price because the term price is supposed to be rooted in production economics. It collapsed to be nothing more than the carry, the forward carry on surplus spot disposal. As the spot market is tightened up, we've seen, I would say, three distinct changes to the market. Number one is tenors have gone back out. It is very common now for us to be involved in conversations with utilities. They're not looking for two to four years out. They're looking two to seven. 
or two to 10 years out. And why that's important is because there's no carry trade. There's no buy today and hold it that satisfies that. It shifts the conversation back to incumbent producers. Secondly, volumes are going up, not just because more years are being added, but volumes are going up because utilities watching the price strength and watching the thinness of the spot market, having real questions about where future supply is coming from, are looking to take bigger bites out of each year. So they're adding in more years and they're taking bigger bites out of each year. So tenors are going up, volumes are going up. And really interestingly, timeframes are going up. So even the utilities that are very forward thinking, the ones who uh, understand that the supply shouldn't be taken for granted and they come to the market early, even those utilities are not satisfied that they're well covered, say, till 2027 or 28. They're looking way out into the 2030s. So, for example, Bruce Power came to us and signed a deal 2030 to 2040. That's a pretty forward looking utility underpinning a very important source of clean energy there in Ontario for you. So with tenors going up, volumes going up, and timeframes going out, it really is that leading indicator that we're moving in to a more robust uh, security of supply-driven contracting cycle. In the past, the flex component was part of contracts whereby fuel buyers would be allowed to take delivery of additional pounds, typically by a certain percentage amount. But is flex contracting still being included in new contracts? It would appear that uh, some of the folks that are offering material out into the future are also offering uh, more flex, more flex than we would be prepared to give. Uh, that's for sure. But at this part in the cycle, when more demand is coming into the market, producers are able to, to hold that flex capacity uh, more for themselves uh, and and use that to drive future value going forward. So that is changing in the market. But, you know, if you look at some of the, the trade reporting, you would see that obviously there's some folks out there still willing to offer, say, a 10% flex on an annual uh, delivery. Now, flex actually, uh, it needs to be thought of appropriately in our industry. Sometimes I get asked by investors, especially investors that are new to the space, well, that means you'd have less deliveries in a high price environment. And actually, the opposite is true. Uh, our fuel buyers tend to be pro-cyclical with their flex. The price of uranium is going up. It signals uranium is scarce versus signaling, oh, well, if the price is going up, there's going to be a lot of investment in future supply. It creates the opposite signal. If price is going up, it must be because it's getting scarce. And therefore, a, a utility is more likely to flex up when prices are rising. But when a utility flexes up with a producer, if that producer doesn't immediately have the pounds, then they might be encouraging that producer to go into the short term market, the spot market and buy. And if a producer shows up to buy in the spot market, it's probably going to have a, an upward pressure on uranium prices. And if it's a market related contract, you're ultimately delivering in to, well, then the utility is just going to pay more by forcing someone to flex up. So so flex is, a, is, is kind of a complicated uh, aspect of contracting, but, but in general, uh, producers are in a position where they can retain that flexibility for themselves under the new contract. And just a follow-up question on contracting, but given this positive move that we've seen in both the spot market and the term market in the past year, what other clauses have you implemented so you can participate in these higher moves in the coming years? Right. So uh, just as a bit of a, a 101 on long-term contracting for folks new to the story, um, and we often hear this, people say, well, why are you doing any long-term contracting? Why would you be locking in the price today? Well, remember, in our industry, term contracts have two ends of the spectrum. There is the one end of the spectrum, which is a fixed price or base escalated term contract. And the way those work, is you might come to Cameco and you might say, look, I'm, I'm looking for 200,000 pounds of uranium per year, 2025 to 2030, and I want it to be fixed. What we would normally do is we would turn to either Traytech or UX's long-term price indicator, which I think they're both right around $60 US today. And we don't really quarrel over where it starts, but we fight over how it escalates, how it escalates to first delivery and how it escalates through 2025 to 2030. 
those contracts, uh, a lot of utilities want those because I think utilities have a sense the price of uranium is going up. So if you can fix something now, maybe you can avoid further increases in the uranium price. We're not overly interested in those contracts. What we prefer are contracts, uh, this part of the cycle, are contracts that are market related. So you come to Cameco, you want 200,000 pounds, 2025 to 2030. We're not going to price those today. We're just going to agree how they're going to be priced out in the future at time of delivery. You might want it the spot price indicator. I might want a six month rolling average of the spot price. We might want to blend between the spot and term price at time of delivery. That's where we want to be. At this point in the cycle, looking at these supply demand uh, fundamentals, we want to be market related in order to have that leverage going out into the future. And it's very uncommon for a utility that agrees to a market related contract to be able to do that in an uncolored way. I mean, I can only think of maybe two or three utilities globally that are allowed to sign a market related contract with no floor, no ceiling. I mean, a utility typically has a value at risk metric. I mean, these are very complicated organizations. The, you know, our typical fuel buyer is a master's trained nuclear engineer. I mean, these are very clever people and managing risk is what they do. So this notion that, oh, you're going to sign market related contracts and they're going to be completely uncollared. Well, you might get a couple hundred thousand pounds per year sold under that. So typically a utility will ask for a ceiling. And if a utility asks for a ceiling, we'll always ask for a floor. And what's happened over the last 18 months is just a structural shift up of where floors are sitting and ceilings are sitting. I can't speak for other producers, but I know that when we're in the market contracting today, we're looking for $50 escalated floors and higher, and we're looking for mid 80 escalated ceilings and higher. And the t with each turn of a market related contract, you turn those higher. And as the spot price goes up and the term price goes up, then you just want to capture more of that forward value. That's where we want to be right now. And it's really important for investors to understand because they, th they'll they often be misled by some, especially new entrants to this market who go, oh, well, we don't want to give upside leverage. And so they'll say things like, we're going to be spot exposed out into the future. Absolutely the foolish way to think about it in our market. You don't want to be spot exposed. You want to be market related in the future. In other words, you don't want to build productive capacity as a producer and sit on it and try to jam it through the spot market when it becomes available. You want to build homes for it now, but you want those homes to have leverage to future prices. So if you think about the way we build a contract portfolio, our leverage comes in two main forms. The first is our current committed sales that are market related. So we call that portfolio leverage. As prices go up, our portfolio prices go up. But then we have pipeline leverage. At this point in the cycle, we have a lot of pounds under negotiation. They're not priced yet by definition, and they are completely levered to the future. And as the prices go up in the near term, then we can negotiate additional value capture in the stuff that we haven't committed to yet. So portfolio and pipeline leverage builds homes, keeps productive capacity out of the spot market, but gives you participation in a market that we think needs to improve, but gives you downside protection if somebody shows up with an asset and starts to jam it through the spot market and pushes the price down like other producers have done in the past, well, then you're protected from that. So this is a contracting strategy fit for purpose the way the uranium market works. All very interesting points. So that's a good overview of what's happening on the uranium side. Now, another very critical role that Cameco plays within the fuel cycle is conversion. And Cameco operates the only conversion facility in Canada. And so I want to also discuss this. But what's nameplate capacity at Port Hope and what is its current capacity? Yeah, and uh, conversion is I'm absolutely delighted that people are paying attention to it for you know 48 of the last 50 years nobody cared about the conversion part of the business we we never got asked about it but but obviously with what's going on in this market with utilities coming to the market and looking on a self-sanctioning basis to replace their dependence on russian enriched uranium product it actually has a cascade upstream 
Because if you're replacing Russian enrichment, Russian enrichment as a service used to show up in the Western market because it was attached to a canister of UF6. So if you're shunning Russian enrichment, you're actually out the conversion in the uranium that it's attached to. So no surprise, you've seen upward pressure in the conversion space as well. If you have more Western enrichment, you need more Western conversion. So conversion is receiving a lot of attention right now. As you mentioned, in the West, we have one of the very important facilities in Port Hope. It's the only one running in North America right now. The other one, the Converdine facility, is ramping up to return to the market. Uh, but I, I believe they haven't declared commercial production yet at that facility. Then you have a third facility in, in Europe, and uh, Rano owns it. It's in Turkestan in France. And, uh, and, and it's running below nameplate capacity. And then, of course, there's a facility in the UK. If all of those were up and running, Western conversion can almost match Western demand. But right now, that's not the case. You've got Port Hope facility running. You've got the French flat plant running. So we've been looking to increase production at Port Hope, where nameplate is about 12. I think license is 12,500. What's required to get there is, you know, just your usual maintenance and replacement capital, a little more activity on site. But conversion's just like uranium. Y you don't build productive capacity and then start knocking on people's door and saying, well, do you want to buy some conversion? You wait for the demand to come to the market. Then you make the production decisions in order to produce into that committed sale. So conversion continues to be uh, a, an important part of the nuclear fuel cycle. There's a lot of attention on it. We continue to do a lot of forward contracting for our conversion service. Um, and we expect that to continue because it will take time for the Western supply to match the Western demand. And as long as the self-sanctioning is going on, it, it su should suggest a, a pretty long tail of, of demand for conversion going forward. So Cameco is involved in all facets of the fuel cycle with the exception of enrichment. Is this something... Chemical would look at in the future? Well, ab absolutely. Uh, we've always wanted to be in the enrichment business. I think you can go back, we're 35 years old to this year. Uh, I think this in a couple of weeks, we're 35 years old. I think you'll always find references to enrichment in our disclosures in that entire time. Enrichment's just a very important piece of our industry. Uh, after years of trying to buy our way into existing enrichment and, and not being able to do that, we decided in 2008 to explore our way in, explore our way in through a third generation technology called global laser enrichment. And it's had, you know, moments of promise. And then, of course, there were many years where the enrichment price was very low. It was an oversupplied market, thanks to the Russians. But now with everything going on in this market, this self-sanctioning, this moving away from Russian enrichment, there's a swim lane for global laser enrichment. And that swim lane ranges from re-enriching depleted UF6 in the United States to produce natural UF6 to help solve the conversion problem that we just talked about, all the way through to high levels of enrichment, up to 19.75% for some of these advanced nuclear reactors. And then, of course, the big one right down the middle is just regular LEU to replace the Russians. So we're really excited about this project. But again, just like conversion and just like uranium, you have to build the support case for making an investment like in GLE. And that is, you have to continue to advance the technology, which we're doing with our partner Silex, really happy with the performance there. You have to figure out what the pathway is from a market opportunity point of view. There's legislation to ban Russian uranium, but it's in draft form, or Russian EUP, it's in draft form. It, at the moment, the Russians are not banned, from accessing any Western market. So you'd want some certainty and predictability on that. And then of course you wanna build a support case with the utilities. The, the last thing you wanna do is build a uranium mine, build a conversion plant, build an enrichment facility, and then start knocking on people's doors and trying to sell it. That's not the way our market works. A utility never has substantial in-year demand for when your production is there. You always have to be very, very thoughtful in building the support case going forward. So same discipline we apply to uranium, we will apply to an entry into the enrichment space, but the opportunity has never been brighter. Cran, you made mention earlier that we were both in London for the World Nuclear Symposium, and I'm sure you met with many buy-side investors. 
I want to get a sense of the the investors you met with. Are they long only funds, hedge funds, family offices focused on energy, ESG? Yes, <laughs> I would say it's all of the above. I, for the last about two and a half years, as the clean energy story became more and more about nuclear power, and then that collided with an energy security story, because if you have nuclear power, not only is it clean, but the nature of nuclear power and the nature of the way a nuclear power plant is, is fueled, these things run for a long time, and then they have some inventory attached to them. They're very, very secure sources of power at a time when folks are worried about gas supplies and they're worried about uh, building grids with uh, thermal-based generation. So as that started to pick up, our origination has never been higher. Um, our vice president of investor relations, Rochelle Girard, uh, it's, it's weekly that, that we're having introductory meetings with big institutionals, with family offices, with, with hedge funds, with, with folks that have never looked at the nuclear industry before and never thought about the upstream value that can be created, you know, may have always thought of us as a mining company, for example, and thought of us as kind of a spot commodity. And then they get to know the industry and they get to know how we contract and how we build durable value going forward with investment grade utilities. And they like that and they like it a lot. And so they, they normally wouldn't have wandered into the resource world, but they like the way we build value in the resource world. So um, that origination continues to be high, a lot of new introductory calls. Uh, and then obviously the follow up with, with long term shareholders who have been very delighted with the recognition across the capital markets of the role that a company like Cameco can play in this. So we just continue to, to be very busy on that front, telling the Cameco story, telling the nuclear story, and making sure that maybe what escaped the transition last time, uh, making sure that investors don't aren't misled about the uranium market, that they understand the unique market structure. If, if what you want is spot exposure, stay away from the uranium industry. But if what it, what it, if what you want is a company that can take what can be a quick move in a commodity price, but lock that in for long-term value, then you're going to like the uranium sector and you're going to like the way Cameco does things. But we we've got just a there's a higher level of understanding among gl the global investor base about how the market works and how the market's structured and what the industrial landscape is and a lot more interest in the downstream than there was in the past. And, and an understanding that, yeah, being a uranium only producer is, it's interesting, but it doesn't create as much potential value as actually being across the whole value chain. So we've just seen a, a step change increase in investor understanding of just how exciting this investment opportunity is. Grant, as we wrap up, I want to get your thoughts on M&A within the uranium sector. In the lithium sector, we have seen a, a lot of direct investments by OEMs into producers, but also Explorco's. We've seen lithium producers invest in, in small Explorco's. Do you think we'll see that within the uranium sector, whereby a utility, for example, might come in and make an investment in a producer or a developer? It's happened before, so obviously not prepared to rule it out, but here's the context. A long-term contract is the way a utility builds a reliable supply chain. So in the uranium industry, actually, that direct relationship with the supplier to avoid an intermediary, to not rely upon traders and brokers and a metal exchange, well, that's always been there in the uranium sector. So for the vast the vast majority of utilities around the planet, it's that direct long-term contract with an incumbent supplier who has licensed permitted facilities, who has multiple sources of production, who has a presence in the market in order to, you, you can count on them to always deliver. That's what's always replaced the need to sort of jump all the way upstream and invest in your own supply. It's happened in the past, and I would say with very little success. Um, because a major like Cameco, well, we don't need an invest. We don't need a utility to invest with us uh, in developing our assets. 
we don't develop our assets till the demand is there and we built the book for it and we have the cash flow to develop it. So then that often leaves the only opportunity to be partner with a junior. And it's the history tells us it's very difficult for a nuclear utility to get their head around the challenge of developing a greenfield. In the nuclear world, it's about precision and it's about repetition and it's about doing things at a 99.999 Six Sigma level of precision. That's not mining. When we bring a nuclear engineer to, to a mine and they understand that our mining engineers have never seen the same ground twice. You know, the hundreds of millions of pounds that have come out of MacArthur River, it's never come out exactly the same twice. There's too much variation in mining. There's too much risk in mining. So the typical nuclear engineer goes, whoa, I, I, you take on that risk. We'll sign a long-term contract. If you have any production issues, that's on you to source. I'm not taking that risk. So I, I would never say never, but the history has not been good. And long-term contracts are a very, very effective way for nuclear utilities to have a relationship with the supply side without actually taking on that risk of greenfield development. And it goes back probably to your opening question. The only people who say this is easy are the people who have never done it. Well, that's a great way to wrap up. And I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today, Grant, and providing insights. Yeah, great to catch up with you as always and uh, look forward to doing it again. Well, that concludes another conference. I want to thank everybody for being with us today. We have some amazing conferences coming up in the coming weeks, so be sure to subscribe to our channel, Wall Street Capital, and also follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Once again, thank you for your support.